Yes, it's me, it's Benedict, and... Oh, uh, hi there. What exactly are you? I am, or was, Huey Toonmore of Huey's Anime Movie Reviews. Maybe you've heard of me? Can't say it rings a bell. How did you wind up here in Scotland, anyway? A fellow reviewer used his hell gun to open up a portal for me. As to why it sent me here of all places, well, it was pretty much a crapshoot. Speaking of, what is this channel anyway, and who are you? Well, uh, my name is Benedict Terry. I'm an animator by trade, but I've been trying to get YouTube views by doing cartoon reviews. Ah, that explains it. Animation is my thing, after all. Same goes for me. <laughs> so what's your deal, anyhow? Thought you'd never ask. So, you understand all that? <sighs> Just like with Roshi. Hey! Oh, 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 oh yeah. Uh, do I really have to explain? Hey, you're so much more time your body. It's been three years since you made any reviews and you're trying to do collaboration reviews to try and set yourself back into it. Wow, you really were paying attention. But then, what made you fall asleep? Hmm. Well, anyway, I'll have to get reviewing. Hmm. Hey, uh, mind if I check out your videos first? I want to see what kind of show I'm dealing with here. Right, so I was hoping to save the emotionally manipulative montage for the season finale next month. Oh well! What was that? It's like a whole season where the video reviews are just downloaded into my psyche all at once! So you see, my specialty is classic cartoons, right? Yeah, I really dig it. Old school cartoons really do need more attention. But you only have like, what, 114 subscribers? That's not fair. You honestly deserve a lot more than yeah, that. Yeah, I know, I know. It's hard being an animator on our lowest common denominator YouTube. <sighs> right, this intro's gone on for longer than I usually do, so what do you want to do? Well, I've noticed you reviewed a lot of stuff by the Flesher Brothers. Betty Boob, Rudolph, various other shorts. However, I feel like there's one character you've overlooked. Well, look at that be. Popeye? Close! Oh yeah, superheroes aren't really my bag. Can you take point? Gladly. Created by writer Jerry Siegel and artist Joe Schuster, Superman first premiered in Action Comics No. 1, released on April 18, 1938, becoming the world's first ever comic book superhero, and has since become a national and pop culture icon, with appearances ranging from radio programs, cartoons, TV shows, movies, and so much more. Paramount Pictures soon became interested in Superman and commissioned a series of cartoons to the Fleischer Studios in 1941. At this time though, Max and Dave weren't keen on doing the short, so as a way to reject the project without appearing rude, they told Paramount that producing such a technically complex series of cartoons would cost about $100,000 per short. That would be the equivalent of $1.7 million in today's money, in the hopes that the studio would reject them. But surprisingly enough, Paramount would agree to this, though at half the cost, and the Superman shorts would become a late career smash for the Fleisch Studios, releasing 17 in total from 1941 to 1943. The cartoons themselves still remain very influential to this day, inspiring the likes of the DC animated universe, and even influencing the king of anime himself, Hayao Miyazaki. In these cartoons, he went up against mad scientists, robots, and the various other criminals of Metropolis. Hell, even in the later Famous Studios cartoons, he went up against the Axis powers. Wow, he went up against the actual real-life evils of the world, huh? Hey, it was World War II. Plus, he also fought them in the comics. We needed the morale boost at the time, and who better to give it to us than Superman? But for this review, let's look at one of his earlier shorts. I'll let you pick. Alright then, I think we should take a look at the fourth cartoon in the series, released in February 1942, The Arctic Giant. Ooh, nice choice. Now while the term It's a Bird, It's a Plane, It's Superman was brought over from the 1940 radio program, the Fleischer cartoons would introduce its own famous tagline that would forever be associated with the character. Faster than a speeding bullet, more powerful than a locomotive, able to leap tall buildings at a single bound, this amazing stranger from the planet Krypton, the Man of Steel, Superman! You know, I've often wondered, why is it that Superman's S-Shield is different in the cartoons than it is in the comics? Hmm, you know, you bring up a very good point. 
In the comics and other media, his shield consists of an S inside of a red diamond with a yellow background. In the Flesher cartoons, the S is still red, but the diamond is gold along with a black background. But why exactly? Honestly, no one's really quite sure why it was changed. However, this variant of Superman's S shield has become iconic in its own right and would later appear in the comics of the 1940s, as well as other comics such as Darwin Cook's Justice League New Frontier, inspiring Superman's look in the miniseries Kingdom Come, and would appear for the first time in live action in the CW series Superman and Lois. Show off. Anyway. The story begins with an archaeological expedition into Siberia that leads to a monumental discovery. A huge monster, as lifelike in appearance as when it roamed the earth millions of years ago in the Mesozoic Age, is found frozen in the ice in a state of perfect preservation. The ice is carried thousands of miles on a freighter in a special refrigeration unit to the Natural Museum of Science in Metropolis, where the oversized Yoshi is displayed to the public. Well, there's a guarantee that nothing will go wrong. Wait, Tyrannosaurus? That thing is supposed to be a Tyrannosaurus Rex? Like hell it is! I mean, even for 1940 standards, does that thing even look like a T-Rex to you? Looks more like Disney's reluctant dragon to me. <laughs> Who died and made you king of archaeology? Paleontology. That's different. And look at the date of when it lived. 2400 BC? That's a few million years off, isn't it? What, this thing was around with the Egyptian pharaohs? Hmm. Meanwhile at the Daily Planet, Editor-in-Chief Perry White receives a call from the museum. And you mean to say that if the ice were permitted to thaw, there's a possibility the monster might still be alive? I'd believe that, if it weren't for those frozen mammoth carcasses they keep finding in Siberia. Don't see how they can revive them without cloning, but I'll give this a pass since, you know, comic books. Yeah. So Lois laying his sand out to get a scoop, much to Clark Kent's surprise. Oh, Lois, want me to go over there with you? No, thanks. You'd probably faint if you saw the monsters. You scare so easily. Maybe she's right, but Superman hasn't fainted yet. By the way, Lois and Clark are voiced by Joan Alexander and Bud Collier, who both reprised their roles in the Superman radio program, and will later reprise their roles again 20 years later in the 1966 filmation cartoon, The New Adventures of Superman. <laughs> nice facts. Hey, I'm an animation reviewer. Comes with a job. So Lois is taken to the generator room for the refrigerator and is shown how it works. Refrigeration. The control board is downstairs. Unfortunately, the operator, like an idiot, leaves the oil can to vibrate into the generator. And sure enough... Boy, what a story! Of course, the temperature rises and the ice begins to drip. Kinda like how things are going down in the real world, come to think of it. Wow, that escalated fast, didn't it? I mean, was Metropolis suffering an extreme heat wave or something? An iceberg that big shouldn't be able to melt so quickly. Outside, everybody! Step lively, please! Use the nearest exit! While the museum guards evacuate everyone from the building, Lois, story-hungry thrill-seeker she is, sneaks in to call the Daily Planet about what's going on, right as the ice finishes melting and Sharptooth awakens. You know, something's always bothered me about this cartoon. Hmm? The monster never roars in it. I mean, he opens his mouth a lot, but never does he actually make a sound. It's kind of disappointing, really. Let's fix that, shall we? Better? I guess. Personally, I'm more concerned with how it suddenly outgrows the museum it fitted perfectly in mere seconds ago, but this is a cartoon about a flying man dressed in long underpants, so who am I to argue? <laughs> what? Oh, you'll see. Now for some good old-fashioned giant monster city destroying action. What exactly is it about kaiju monsters that makes people want to crash their cars? Speaking of, should the arctic giant even be considered a kaiju? 
Well, considering this cartoon was made before the term became popular and considering he's not radioactive, I'd say it's open for debate. Let's take a look at the statistics. He's much larger than any real theropod dinosaur known, despite the name he's given in the museum, has somehow survived being frozen in ice for tens of millions of years, has the raw strength to break through walls and smash buildings, and his scaly skin is strong enough to withstand gunfire. So, kaiju? Kaiju. Alright then. Meanwhile, back at the Daily Planet, Clark hears of the giant's rampage and realizes Lois is still at the museum. Which means... This looks like a job for Superman. Now, before we continue, I just want to state that these series of animated shorts are historically significant for giving Superman his famous ability to fly. Before this, in the comics, he could only leap from building top to building top. Now at first, the Fleshers did animate Superman leaping, but deemed it silly looking, and asked permission from Action Comics to just make him fly instead, which thankfully they agreed to. Why bring that up? Would you like to see what the leaping animation looks like? <laughs> yeah, that is definitely silly looking, so good call, Max and Dave. Superman gets to the museum, sorts through the rubble while ignoring the other injured people trapped inside, and rescues Lois. You'd better get back to your office where you'll be safe. I've got some work to do. Superman! He speaks! Seriously though, this is the first time Superman speaks as Superman in these cartoons. That's right. And it's really clever of Bud Collier to switch from his tenor voice to a baritone when going from Clark to Superman. Meanwhile, back with Littlefoot, uh, permission to say, oh damn. Too obvious, huh? The giant busts through the dam, no doubt drowning hundreds of people in the process. No matter, Superman literally moves a mountain to block off the water. Quick thinking on his part. The giant then stomps past a blockade of fireboats and their hoses and demolishes a suspension bridge. You know, I've often wondered how the Tacoma Narrows Bridge fell down. Fortunately, Superman comes to save the day and raises the bridge to allow the cars to continue driving. The giant then makes his way towards a baseball stadium and, what do you know, Lois just so happens to arrive there as well, risking her own life yet again like the idiotic lemming she is. Well, you are right, she is a bit reckless. You know, those people seem a little too happy to see a monster heading their way. But luckily, Superman has some suspension cables left over and throws them at the beast. Well, that's one way to bring down a rampaging dinosaur. Lois Lane, proving that just because journalism can risk your life doesn't mean you should try. But of course, Superman comes in to save her from the literal jaws of death. Now this time, stay put. Yes, my lord, and thanks. <gasps> so Superman finally subdues the giant, which is revealed on the newspaper front page to have been put on display at the park zoo where it is forced onto all fours with its hands and feet chained and anchored in what is essentially a giant empty swimming pool with no signs of enrichment or even fresh water to drink. Yikes, look I know it destroyed a few buildings though, but that is still potentially the last living dinosaur. Yeah, at least give him some fake trees to rub against or something. Jeez, it's like zoos had absolutely no standards back then. You showed plenty of courage getting that monster story, Lois. Thanks, but where were you? Me? Oh, I must have fainted. Oh, Clark, you sneaky scoundrel. <laughs> well, that was the Arctic Giant. So, Huey, any thoughts? You first. After all, this is your show. All right. So, how do you feel reviewing an action cartoon for once? Well, this is certainly quite an interesting take on Superman, as the first time he's taken on a giant prehistoric monster. As for the short itself, the animation is very good, literally looking like a comic book come to life, though the giant's somewhat cartoony design does clash a little with the rotoscoped humans. The backgrounds look good as well, especially that Art Deco design for the buildings in Metropolis. The pacing though is great, as it keeps a good sense of tension throughout, leaving viewers to eagerly anticipate 
anticipate what's coming next. I'd have to agree. Some plot elements do seem very rushed, like the ice melting at the museum, but with a running time of just over 8 minutes and being primarily for children, I can give it some slack. Some of the earlier Flesher Superman shorts do have their silly moments, but would get a little darker and more serious later down the line. However, some of the sillier aspects would return when Flesher Studios was reorganized and renamed to Famous Studios. As for this short, it's pretty fun, almost feeling like a forebearer to the giant monster on the loose movies you'd see in the 1950s and 60s, and thankfully it is the only time they'd ever have Superman leaping like in the earlier comics and just have him fly from then on. It definitely deserves its reputation as a classic entry into the Fleischer Superman shorts. Well, thanks for that one, Huey. It was quite the experience. It was my pleasure, man. So... How do I get out of here exactly? I really do need to get back to my body, you know. And a few thousand miles adrift as well. Hmm. It's not like I can just say hocus pocus and get you back to your body. I've only just met you, so I wouldn't even know where your body would be. Can you send me to another of you who might help me? Maybe. Only how? Aha! What is it? I just remembered. I just amped up a satellite to reach every computer on Earth for various reasons. Wow! How convenient! <laughs> I know, right? So, how does this work? Well, I can just alter the wavelengths to pick up any wandering souls and then literally pick them up and... Let me guess. My destination would be another crapshoot, huh? Well, whoever clicks on their email link first. Let's hope it's someone I know, then. Okay, I'm ready. Well, frequency set. Any last words? Yeah. See you at the movies. Anime movies, that is. I hope. Okay, here we go. Hmm. It worked. Good luck, Mr. Toonbore. Well... Thank you for watching, if you like this be sure to like and subscribe, and if you're interested you can check out Huey's channel to see his reviews. As for me, I've got my season 1 finale coming next month, uh, and I've got something special. I'll see you then.